the theme of today is uh, really set in the context of what I was told is the theme of your program, and that is energy and leadership in the context of a startup environment. I must say, though, it's not that the book itself has restricts itself to takeaways for only startups, but uh, I think today there is an entrepreneurial boom in the country. And unfortunately, along with that, though, the failure rate of new enterprises is exceedingly high. And so the purpose of this book, as well as I would say the talk, is to help people identify a few basic fundamentals, which if taken care of, uh, would prevent or improve your chances and probability for success. Before I do proceed, I'd love to get a little bit of a, I'd like to ask a couple of questions maybe, a show of hands also. Uh, how many people in this group here are already entrepreneurs or do you have plans to become entrepreneurs? Maybe I could just get a show of hands. So this is amazing. It is a very, very large uh, proportion of this group. I typically get such a high proportion when I speak at the Taikons because that is by definition an entrepreneurial organization. Now, out of those of you who already have started, can I get another show of hands? To, I'll ask you two questions. How many of you have bootstrapped or funded your own business through friends and family? And how many of you have gone out to get external investment? It could be in the form of uh, angel investment, uh, VC investment, maybe even private equity. So how many of you have bootstrapped your operations? Okay, it looks to me a little less than half. So let me then ask the other question to complete the picture. How many of you have taken external funding to help you get started? Okay, I don't think I've got these two groups adding up to the first total that I saw, but a very large proportion very clearly have done self-funding. So anyhow, with this, let me get on to the theme of today's conversation. Why should I point this this way? Anyway. Okay. So here's the uh, subject that I've put up. There are really two parts I was told that you are focusing on. One is energy, and the second one is leadership. So in energy, I'll be talking about having, creating a shared mission and vision, alignment through values, unique culture, sharing of wealth, and then finally, because nothing succeeds like success, uh, without that, you're never going to have reinforcing energy. Uh, in leadership, there are a few organizational principles. There's a, issues of creating a great place to work, and then certain personal characteristics that you will need, particularly in a startup environment. So, coming to the mission and vision, you know, a mission statement must be both inspirational, it must be simple, and it must be aspirational. I will give you one example, per se, I will choose Happiest Minds to illustrate this next. And then it's not just enough to articulate those statements. These need to be internalized. They must be something which everybody knows, believes in, so that it begins to influence their behavior through continuous uh, communication, as well as certain feedback me mechanisms. And finally, I think the most important purpose of a mission and vision statement is that it must create a sense of purpose which is beyond just making money and profits. It is this larger purpose which then will create organizational energy, will create pride. So here let me... Uh, oops. Yeah. Let me illustrate this through the uh, Happiest Minds mission, mission and Vision Statement. It was really not my intent today to talk a lot about Happiest Minds. Uh, <clears throat> but I think the best illustration of this example that I can think of is through this. And that again, because it came largely through the learning experiences that we went through. I do remember on one occasion uh, being asked to address uh, the offshore development team of one of the largest Indian uh, multinational banks, their development center in India. The theme that I was asked to speak about is creating the best offshore development center in the country. When I asked people for a show of hands, 
that how many of you know what is the mission statement of your company and what is the vision of your company? It wasn't surprising to me that I barely got two hands which went up out of a whole, maybe a group of about 300 people. So it was a team of a group of this size. And again, the importance of saying, if you're going to have these statements, these need to be simple, they need to be understood, they need to be completely internalized. So the mission statement of Happiest Minds is as simple as it could be. Happiest people, happiest customers. I guess nobody within our company will ever forget it. You could ask somebody in the corridor, they would tell you what it is. We have a five-year vision, uh, and this really becomes our defined goals. The mission statement could last forever. The vision statement is clearly there for a finite purpose. And you'll see how it then lines up with the very first part, and that is our issue of being happiness evangelists for each other, our customers and society. This again is about creating a sense of purpose. We had a strategic objective for starting the company to focus on uh, digital transformation. And this was our softer objective of, in a sense, spreading the happiness movement within the world and being happiness evangelists for each other. We've said that, and this is again another important part of being a success, you have to frame your objectives. We are a VC funded company. We told our VCs in the very beginning that we will go public by the year 2020. That sets the expectations up clearly, and then it doesn't create pressures on the organization. Uh, we clearly have to be known as a company with the highest standards of corporate governance. We, we're a technology and a knowledge business, and therefore very important for us to frame our thought leadership objective. Because we started with disruptive technologies, what it really means is that as and when new technologies come out, we will embrace these faster than others. Also, it does imply that we will generate a large proportion of our sales through intellectual property. And then finally, to be a leader in social responsibility initiatives. This again helps, apart from the fact that it is a belief with us as founders, it's again a very important part of building pride within an organization. People are very happy to be involved in an organization which is giving back. Uh, the mission, the vision statement must have specific measurement criteria. I won't go through all those, but the main point I wanted to highlight is that, you know, when you start a company, you have so many things to do. It's very unlikely that at that time, one of your priorities is going to be to go and create a mission statement or a vision statement or articulate your values. But I believe that these are really essential and which should be done even as you start your company. So then, continuing with the energy theme, the most important part of this is really alignment through values. Values determine your behavior, they become your guide. And again, I'll give you one example that when we started Mindtree, we had articulated values, we hadn't at that stage gone through the process of uh, internalizing them. And we had a lot of, I would say, friction within the teams where uh, the American co-founders and the Indian co-founders seem to be completely at loggerheads. One day, I had a consultant who came in from America. He was a professor at the Fordham College in New York. And I said, how do you manage these pulls in different directions due to the different cultural or orientation of the founding team? So he gave a wonderful answer. He said, look, culture is not something you need to manage. You have to celebrate it as a source of differences, different ways of thinking, but how you align your organization is through your values. And then he asked us, how many of you uh, really know and understand your values? And there again, we got a surprise because hardly anybody was willing to come up and articulate those values. It is then that we went back to the drawing board, articulated in those days what we called as our class values. And it is that learning experience that we took through in articulating the values at Happiest Minds. Uh, where this time I could say we got it right the first time. The acronym helps for retention, but then it has to go beyond that. It has to go to be built into various programs that you're running. In our case, for example, we reinforce this through communication all the time. Uh, I address every group who joins the company on the mission, vision, and values. We have 
360 degrees feedback for everybody, including myself, on how you conform to and live by those values. And then finally, you convey what is important to you as a leadership team by including these in your various reward and recognition programs. Uh, continuing once again with the uh, energy theme, you know, one of the things that anybody who does in a startup is to create differentiators for your company. And one thing that you will learn and realize is that all differentiators really have a shelf life. Something may last for two years, three years in a fast moving environment. The one differentiator that cannot get replicated, which can last you literally in perpetuity as you keep renewing it, is the unique culture that you'll create for your organization. Uh, creating the right culture doesn't come all that easily. It's not a black box where you feed in something and get out a culture. It's something that you truly have to work on. Uh, cultures can turn toxic from time to time. There may be some step that management or leadership took in good faith, maybe something in the environment, maybe even certain personalities who are toxic in nature. And then when that happens, I think it's important for you to confront it and lead from there, address the issues, get to the root causes and see that you rectify things. I've mentioned earlier about the reward and recognition scheme. Uh, it's very important to build emotional infrastructure while you're there. This is what will see you through difficult times, the bonding that takes place within the organization. And finally, again, coming down as a precedent to the area of success, it's important equally to set challenging goals. You know, people have to know that it's worthwhile to, to climb a mountain when you start in a, a journey like this. And those challenging goals actually increase and address energy. They should not be impossible to achieve, but this certainly should require a stretch and require people then to look at it as a challenge which we have achieved and overcome. And just finally to quote Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast. I'm sure that when Peter Drucker wrote about strategy, he would have had an equally powerful phrase for that, and he does. But just, just to drive home a point on the importance of creating the right culture. So, coming on now to, I think, the last point on energy, which is the sharing of wealth. I do find that a lot of organizations in India, when we start up, don't believe that we need to plan for the sharing of wealth. If you take Silicon Valley, I think it's almost like a fundamental given that 20% of the original share capital, which becomes 16.6% when you add on the 100 to the 20, is kept aside for the employee stock option scheme. In India, most of the young entrepreneurs I meet will tell you, yes, we are thinking about a scheme, yes, we may be doing it, or we have kept aside some small sum, but the percentages are really niggardly. I believe that when you create an organization where you must, and it's going to require the whole organization's effort, there must be a generous sharing of wealth. And that again is going to be important for people to feel a sense of ownership, of a sense of feeling that yes, we've contributed to the success and we look forward to its results for ourselves. Uh, at Happiest Minds, I must tell you, we've gone even further than Silicon Valley, where we kept 25% of the original stock for our ESOP scheme. Uh, other aspects, I think uh, a lot of details needed here, but if you were to read the chapter on winning with VCs, you'll find that there can be situations where the Venture itself is a moderate success, but the founders end to lose out. And therefore, it's important to be able to ensure that you have the right clauses in your contracts with the VCs. It's not an antagonistic relationship. It's a win-win relationship. But there can be times when things go sour, and it is in those occasions that you need to protect yourself. Uh, I've talked about the ESO plan. Then the next issue is even when you have the ESOP plan, how do you monetize that? How do you ensure that there is going to be something which comes out out of value for all concerned, including you as the founders? Uh, here, that logically in the end, only two ways. One is you get bought out, and then the other one, which of course in my way is by far the preferred way, if you're able to create a company which you can take public, whereby you capture the valuation at which the market will value your company. 
And finally, on ESOPs, just a word of caution when you create them, taxation issues are very complex. It's a pity to create a huge and generous option scheme and find that you've given away a very large part of the games to the tax authorities. So I would suggest that anybody planning one should certainly look at this up front and see what needs to be done. I have one more point here, uh, here again on nothing succeeds like success for the energy part. And the first thing, of course, to succeed, I think, is your idea. Your, your venture is really going to be as good as your idea. The idea must be differentiated. It must be market validated. It must be scalable so that you can build it to a certain size. And it must be defensible in context of newer competition coming in. It's important to create a well-funded enterprise, and which is the message I would give to those who funded your enterprises yourself. You know, in the end, the largest reason for failure is when a company runs out of cash and therefore cannot continue its operations uh, beyond the, uh, a reasonable stage, or it cannot get its next round of funding. It's important to have the right continuum of strategies. I'm not going to get into the depth on these, those of you, again, who are interested will find a whole series of issues on this. But we look at strategy as uh, a startup strategy, a scale-up strategy, a risk minimization strategy, and so on. And then finally, you go to market your company well, then build a trusted brand. Whether you're a B2C company or a B2B company, in the end, it's the trust that you get across which is going to matter. Let's move to leadership. Uh, we have. The main thing in leadership, in my view, with you, and I would imagine most of you here are founders of your organizations, is really to build the right foundation. And that, I believe, is what is the role of the founders. Uh, it doesn't give the founders any special privilege. It's actually just your responsibility. I believe that one of the other things which, can, which must be avoided at all cost is if the rest of the employees were to think that special privileges are being given to the founders. You'll get a higher proportion of the equity by show, and that's a part of being a founder. But compensation, roles, responsibilities have to be given out completely based on merit. Then creating a framework for the higher standards of corporate governance. You know, as a startup, I'm sure you will see that you're going to be tested at all times. There will be difficult times. There will be times when you may be tempted to cut the corners. But once you're clear that you're going to follow the highest standards of corporate governance, absolutely no deviation, you'll be amazed how life becomes much simpler. And then that's also very critical in terms of both being able to attract and retain talent. That also goes back to the ESOP scheme. And I'd say if these principles are kept in mind, at least you're on your way to creating a good organization. Uh, I think consciously, one of the other things about leadership is to consciously create a great place to work. What I have put up here is a framework given by the, what is called as the Great Places to Work Institute, uh, abbreviated as GPTW. I won't get into the details, but there are two parts to this. There's a trust index and there's a culture audit. Uh, what I do want to emphasize is that, you know, just the act of applying for this and making yourself consciously aware that these are the areas you have to improve, develop, and strengthen in your organization will be a huge value to you. It doesn't matter where you end up in the rank. So I think it's a wonderful framework for you to be able to employ. And then coming down finally to certain personal characteristics. Uh, I think one of the things that any entrepreneurial setup has to see uh, is the ability to cope with failures and setbacks. And therefore with that, the high highs and the low lows which come uh, and the ability to be able to withstand that. So resilience. Perseverance, one of the things that you may sometimes read about is a fail-fast approach. We certainly don't believe in that. We believe that if you have entered a venture, you'll do your very, very best to make it succeed. Though you may need to pivot your strategy, change your course of direction if and when required. Third is risk minimization. It's important to emphasize this because people think of entrepreneurs as risk takers. But everybody is a risk taker. You take a risk when you cross the road today. What is important to my mind as an entrepreneur is how do you minimize the risks? How do you see what are the negatives and then overcome those and anticipate those? And finally, and I think this is again really important, 
you've got to have a great sense of timing. There was a period in my life when I used to compare a CEO with a conductor of a symphony. And I realized that actually this is a much harder role because the conductor knows what's the music that's going to follow. Here, you're living in a world full of uncertainty. There are new competition coming from every side. You don't know which way the market is going. So therefore, the sense of timing, when do you launch, when do you expand, when do you scale up, when do you raise your money, each one of these, I think, requires action at the right time. So with this, I'm through with this. Uh, very happy to have spoken to you all, and I do look forward to a few questions from the audience. That's wonderful. If you can just have microphones spread around, that's great. Let's give them a big round of applause. All right, so if you have questions for uh, Mr. Ashok Sutta, raise your hands and a microphone will magically come to you. But I'm going to warm, warm up the audience, Ashok. Ashok, when we met up in Chennai where I did an interview with you for Hindu Business Line, mm -hmm. uh, one thing that really stood out for me was you said that you read, you actually worked on a workbook a workbook um, that gave a lot of clarity in your mind on what to do in life and achieve in life. Tell us about that. You know, sometimes you may remember things that even I don't. So, <laughs> and again, maybe I used a different uh, word or a phrase also. Uh, you know, essentially the way I see it, I think to be a good manager, you've got to have a game plan. that. And it goes back to the vision, it goes back to almost everything else I talked about. You first look ahead and then work backwards to see what are the steps you have to take. And those steps is what you might have been thinking of when I referred to as the workbook. I think it's very important if you don't know when you're going to go public, if you don't know when you're going to expand, if you don't know what is the total amount of money that you're going to need by the time you feel that you're ready to be cash sufficient. You may find that the actuals will deviate from, reality, from what you thought, but at least you have an overall game plan. After 14 years at, as president of Wipro Infotech, you decided to turn an entrepreneur. And then at 74 years old, you became an author. What was the turning point in your life that made you take these two big jumps? Well, you know, uh, here it's a really interesting personal story in terms of this. This, uh, articulating what I wanted. I probably had thought of it earlier. I was on a vacation in Lakshwadeep, very relaxed vacation with a book of spiritual exercises called Well Springs. The first exercise has a series of questions you ask yourself and one of the questions was what are your unfulfilled desires? And in that I wrote two things. One was to become an entrepreneur and the other one was to write a book. So. The, lo and behold, ultimately at the age of 58, which shows you that you're never too late. You can do this at any time. You certainly don't, uh, though almost all of you have already got started, so that's great. But it took me a long time. And partly I'd say that's because I spent the first 20 years of my life in engineering and then moved on to IT. And the second one was to write this book. I think if I hadn't been so busy running companies, I would have probably done it earlier. But luckily I've done it now, and in fact I'm now beginning to think of the second book. After all, I've got two ventures, so it deserves a second book also. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Sivakumar Palaniyapan. My question is, what do you suggest to a second or a third generation entrepreneur who's trying to rebuild or reshape the culture that's already built in the organization? So you're saying, what do you suggest for someone who wants to rebuild and reshape second your culture? Second or a third generation entrepreneur who wants to rebuild or reshape the culture that's already built yeah. So this is a very tough job. Huh? I mean, let's be clear. It's far easier getting it right in the beginning than having to change it externally. Uh, and of course, but if you need to, you need to. So it is an important thing. You know, I think you're going to need to introduce a whole range of identified uh, interventions, if you will. What are the root causes for what you see as the negatives? And then begin to have interventions to address those. Say, for example, Let's assume that one of your problems is that there's not enough teamwork in your company, which is not surprising because you hire ambitious managers. Their priority is to compete with each other rather than to collaborate. Then you set up programs to enhance collaboration. So that's one typical collabor uh, intervention that you may need to introduce in a situation of this sort. Another aspect of negative culture, frankly, can be 
just a group of toxic persons, maybe one or two, they can uh, end up spoiling the whole culture of your company. I think in those cases also, it's frankly, it's just best to address it head on. I have tried two different approaches in the past. Actually, there's only one person in my life who I ever fired, not for reasons of integrity, not for reasons of performance. He was a high-performing person individually, but completely toxic in, completely in the, as far as the environment was concerned. This was a person who was in Sri Ram refrigeration many years ago when I was in the engineering world. I'd been sent to turn the company around. I felt this individual was just poisoning the environment. I had no option except then to get my chairman's consent and then uh, just tell him that I think we'd lost confidence in him and he'd have to move on. On another occasion, I have tried to very, tried very hard to change the person concerned. But I can tell you one thing, that it's exceedingly difficult to change people when it comes to what I call the fundamentals of their behavior. And for some people, it is worth taking that effort, but you've got to realize that there'll be a big, a big effort, a big price to pay. Hello, sir. I'm sure the thoughts that you shared are going to be a big help to the budding entrepreneur sitting here. So I have two small questions. One, the fact that you started that early in your life, you know, uh, and that you're so successful, clarifies to me perhaps that there is no age to start a business. Right? Sure. But what do you think, how bright are the chances, let's say for someone like me, who has absolutely no business acumen, not from a business family, but have a strong desire, let's say, to get into and start a business, but have no clue starting from B to the S of the word business, right? Hmm. And my second question to you is that, um, what if I were to ask you, what between the two takes an edge over the other? Is it the business acumen or the, simply the desire to, sure. to do it? Yeah, so firstly, I would strongly encourage you to pursue your enthusiasm. And in fact, I'd like to applaud you, madam, for that without the... And, uh, you know, in the end, I think there is an issue of one of the questions I like to ask uh, audiences, and I didn't do it today, uh, because the theme was different, is what came to you first, the idea or the desire to be an entrepreneur? And invariably, I'd say the most successful entrepreneurs are those who had the desire to be one. Then you went and did a methodical search for the idea. And though I don't want to be excessively promoting the book, I think what the book is telling you is that if you follow certain fundamentals, all the way from idea generation to idea validation and then the right strategies for scaling up, etc., etc., you have the fundamentals in place which will help you to improve the probabilities of success. Nobody can guarantee it, but you improve your probabilities of success. So I would say there have never been more opportunities. Funding has never been more easily available. It is important also, I must tell you though, to get the right team together. Because when you go to raise funds, the VCs will look not just at your idea, but they will also look at the quality of the team. I think that's very important to them. So I would say do start on that and think of all the things involved in retaining and attracting the team. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Deepak. Uh, I'm also incidentally an alumnus of the Asian Institute of Management. Okay. My question is too wrong. Uh, first question is, why did it take you 59 years to go the entrepreneurial route? Okay, sure. You were uh, employed for so long. And based is that, uh, you know, in your case, you were already a known name when you went the entrepreneurial route, which means easier for VCs, I mean, easier for you really to relate to VCs and raise money and things like that. But for a youngster who's starting up in the entrepreneurial uh, line, what would be the biggest, I mean, in the, what, from your own experience, what would you have found more difficult if you had tried to start an enterprise 30 years earlier than you did? Yeah. You know, there are several angles in your thing, and I'll, because the world has changed so much, I wouldn't talk of what would have happened 30 years ago. Today, there are 100 times more opportunities than there were last, so we can't talk about that. In a way, you almost answered the first part of your question in your second part. You said, because I had experience, because I had a reputation, it was very easy to attract not just money, but the team. When I announced Happiest Minds, I wasn't ready to start. I said, I'll give myself five months, both to raise funds and to build the team. And I got eight and a half thousand applications through the announcement. I'm not saying that they were all wonderful names, 
but that is the value of experience. There's a huge value also in somebody deciding to start earlier. Uh, I will partly though attempt to address the first part of your question, though I don't think it's now relevant. But I did mention that I spent the first 20 years of my life in engineering. It was a sheer coincidence that I got, uh, you know, through an old friend, Mr. Premji heard about me, uh, called me over to meet him, and then I ended up as the president of Wipro when it was in second year. And remember then also that for the first seven years, Wipro was a computer company. It's really from 94 onwards, perhaps that we became a software company, where all the opportunities for entrepreneurship uh, started burgeoning. So I think that's a mix of various things. Now, what should a young person do today? You know, again, it's more of what I was answering to uh, the lady here. You've got to get the right idea, you've got to validate it, you've got to have a good business plan, and you've got to have a good team. You get those together, and then you work methodically on these steps one by one. Thank you for the insights. My question is, um, you have given a lot of points for what to do for a startup to IPO. I, the question is about what should not be done sure. from startup to IPO. What a person as an entrepreneur should not do it, or sure. as a leader should not do it. You know, there's a lot that you need to be doing which uh, which is right to, in order to succeed. One of the things that is very important is that in really in order to succeed, you need to do multiple things right. But in order to fail, even one or two big failures can cause a very big setback. So in terms again of our book, which I have to keep coming back to, we actually say what and what not, why and why not, how and how not, and when and when not. So those are areas which are addressed all through the span of the book. So I can't just pick out one or two things and tell you what not to do. Clearly one thing that somebody will say is, I'll give you an example, uh, entering the market. I think it's even more dangerous to enter a market too early than it is to enter it late. Because when you enter late, at least you can introduce new differentiators. When you enter early, you have to spend a ton of money to create demand. But that's just one example. There are examples like that sprinkled all through the book. Thank you. Sir, I would like to ask you one question. According to your own experience, what are the key three attributes is required to be a good leader? Uh, actually, I put them there in this context. Though, frankly, the, I will tell you the danger <coughs> issues of taking two or three items. I truly believe that you actually need multiple, multiple skills. Just like I talked about success and failure, you need to succeed on, to succeed, you need to do many things right. A few things wrong can cause you trouble. I mentioned here resilience, perseverance. I'll add one more, which is very appropriate for the theme of this, converse, uh, uh, of this particular uh, conference, and that is energy. I think the most successful leaders I've met are the ones with very high energy levels. Of course, you build energy in your organization, but you've also got to have a high level of energy yourself, and then use that to propagate it within the company.